Oh, George, what about the best butter? Please let me put this in the You know, it it really so, so, that's enough of the masks. Hi, welcome to Celebrity Corner. I'm Evan Davis, your host, and I'll be bringing you behind the scenes interviews with performers and entertainers in Las Vegas. Today we have a fellow, I'll just tell you his name and I'll let him tell you the rest of the story. George Grove. Welcome, George. Thank you very much, Evan. Yes. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I began my musical career with a group called the Kingston Trio, the great folk era of the late 50s and the early 60s, primarily. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with that group for 41 years. It's what I refer to as an adulthood misspent. <laughs> but it was great fun traveling around the country and around the world. Yeah. Uh, and continuing the music of the great folk era. Yeah. And I left the group uh, two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, and began another group. I just decided I wasn't ready to be retired. And the name of the new group, and many of, of your uh, constituents uh, online here have seen and heard us uh, at various places. We have performed for Vegas Voice several times. And we'll continue to do so, Yay. if you'll put in a good word for us. <laughs> um, the name of the new group is the Folk Legacy Trio. So instead of being, uh, I don't use this word pejoratively, confined to the music of the Kingston Trio, because it was wonderful music, mm -hmm. we have embraced the rest of the music and the musical groups from the folk era, mm -hmm. like Peter, Paul, and Mary, the Chad Mitchell Trio, Tom Paxton, Joan Baez, uh, Judy Collins, Bob Dylan, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, God. You know, so we put on a mm. show that uh, we find it very difficult to stop after mm. two, two and a half hours because there's so many great songs from them. How many guys are in the uh, group? We have three guys in the group. Mm. My other two partners are Jerry Siggins, who many people might remember from a great group called the Diamonds, a doo-wop group. He was their lead singer for 27 years. And my other partner is Rick Doherty, who was the gentleman who took Glenn Yarbrough's place in the Limelighters, and then he was in the Kingston Trio for 12 years. So we have a pedigree, and yeah, you we continue that. Do. Yeah. So tell me, um, tell me a little about, about the Folk Legacy Trio. Whenever I see it, I know it's FLT, and I think of Fort Lauderdale uh, Airport for some reason. <laughs> I, I, you know, but um, you've been playing uh, around the country. Mm -hmm. I know that. Tell, tell me a little about some of the uh, adventures you've had in playing in some of the cities, not just with Folk Legacy Trio, but maybe with, uh, with the Kingston Trio. Well, one of my fondest memories was 2004. I mean, that's a little far down the line in the career, but the reason it's special is because at the time it was the Kingston Trio, mm -hmm. and we were invited by the Boston Red Sox to come sing the National Anthem at Fenway Park. Mm -hmm. And they said, of course, if you sing the National Anthem, you have to follow it up with Boston's anthem, which is Charlie on the MTA. So he said, well, of course we'll come. And he said, no, wait a minute, how much does it pay? <laughs> oh yeah, you know, of course we'll come. <laughs> I gotta tell you, the Boston Red Sox are a class organization. It doesn't matter whether you're a fan of the Yankees or the Atlanta Braves yeah. or whomever. The Boston Red Sox are a very, very classy organization. So we were met at the airport by mm -hmm. a beautiful young Irish girl, Boston, you might mm -hmm. expect that. Okay. Red hair, green eyes, freckles, and all business. And oh. she said, gentlemen, I'm going to take you to a beautiful five-star hotel downtown, and you may order anything that you wish and simply sign it to your rooms. And kidding, I said, well, there was that $500 bottle of Cabernet that I saw last time I was here. I'd never been there. She said, sign it to your room. So they treated us very well, nice. very well. So we went out to Fenway Park mm -hmm. and we um, were taken into the business entrance, I shall say, where uh, you walked the pathways through the metal stairways and the concrete ramps yeah. and you went down to the uh, administrative offices beneath. And they had a room that must have been 50 feet by 50 feet that the entire perimeter was king crab and lobster and just every, baked beans and everything you would associate with the being in the Northeast. And I said, who else is gonna be here? She said, nobody, this is all for you. 
we could have lived there for a week and never run out of food. So she finally said, uh, are you ready? It's time to go sing the anthem. So she took us through that, the, the Spinal Tap tour, as uh -huh. I uh, call it, because anyone who's seen that movie, this is Spinal Tap, uh -huh. they get lost backstage. Yes. You know? So we finally get in front of these double doors and she said, are you ready? So, yeah. She opened the doors and there we are at the base of the green monster. And I got to tell you, as a baseball fan, all the memories of every baseball game you've ever seen in your life come flooding in. You know, the, the great American sports story. Yeah. So we sang the national anthem. By the way, left out a very important point. We guaranteed her a victory. <laughs> and she said, don't do that. This was the fourth game of the American League Championship Series between wow. Boston Red Sox and the Yankees. The Yankees. <sighs> and the Yankees were winning three games to none. Oof. One more loss, Boston was out yeah. again after 86 years of no World Series. So we guaranteed a victory, and she said, please don't. Remember the curse of the Bambino. Yeah. We said, don't worry. Every time we've sung the national anthem, the home team has always won. 14th inning of the game, um, Big Pappy hits a home run. run. <sighs> they win the game. They go on and win the next three games and take the American League championship. Then they go to St. Louis and sweep the St. Louis Cardinals in the World Series. So the Kingston Trio changed the cycle. We broke the curse of the Bambino. I, I would think they'd want you to come back every year to for opening day. Uh, I mean, it would, that would have been... I volunteered, yeah. but you know all that lobster and those five hundred dollar well, bottles of wine we drink. <laughs> do you do you usually eat before you perform? That I, I don't know. A lot of people have different superstitions about yeah. that. Um, many singers say anything that has a dairy uh, part to it, you don't do it because it lines the throat. Uh -huh. But um, Rick has a trick. It's a Rick trick. A Rick trick. And it's right before you go on stage, eat an apple. And the acidity in the apple mm -hmm. will take away any of that film on your vocal cords. Really? Wow. So, so other than that, you just try to keep the vocal cords in shape like you would any other muscle. Eat the donuts and then have an apple. Donuts, coffee, an apple. Donuts, coffee, stage. an apple. <laughs> Not, you know, few. I've spent a lot of years on, on the, the road, road. <laughs> on continuing the, road. the great American folk song book. Yeah. Does the road have anything to do with it? I mean, you know, you're on the road away from home. Um, you know, hotels, motels, uh, restaurants, whatever it is. Well, there's a certain um, amount of joy that you have being on the road and being away from some responsibilities mm -hmm. because you can only be responsible for what you bring with you in your suitcase and your carry-on bag mm -hmm. and your banjo case. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, during tax season, you've got one shirt and uh, 50 pounds of receipts that you have to go through. <laughs> but... You have to have a very strong home life and very good support mm -hmm. for the people who love and care about you at home. And I'm so grateful that I do. You did? Okay. And you do. Okay. And you I did do. and you do. So I guess it's the same person you've been with for a long time. Yes. How? How? Yes. How? Cindy. How? Yeah. How long? So, well, she and I have been together for 25 years. Okay. That's good. Enough. So, all right. You were asking about, uh, uh, this is called behind the scenes, right? Behind the scenes, yeah. So let's give some of that behind the scenes. Um. Well, here's a story from, um, oh, about 40 years ago. Okay. And we can edit anything out, so don't worry about it. Just tell it the way it is. I'll try to keep it clean. I'll try. That's the active word there. We had been invited to do a concert tour in Australia. And it's a long trip over there. Yeah. When we finally got there... Um, we were scheduled to be on a show that was the equivalent of the Johnny Carson show here. Mm -hmm. So we go on the show and it happened to coincide with the day that their equivalent of Elvis Presley had died uh, young, just like ours. So we go on the program and we were sitting backstage with a gentleman from the park service on the island of Tasmania. And he had a male and a female Tasmanian devil with him. It's, you know, it's a dog-like animal. Yeah. But it looks very similar to the cartoon character of the Tasmanian devil. And we were, they were in a big cage because uh, rather ferocious little creatures. Mm -hmm. And we were curious and kept poking a broom handle in to <laughs> try to 
get a little action out of the, uh-huh. it was a male, female, the female was all curled up in a corner and the male was guarding. Uh-huh. And uh, sure enough, we got a lot of action out of him and he was quite irate by the time the park ranger took him on the show. <laughs> so he's sitting there with, I'll call him Johnny Carson. I don't know what his name was. And uh, the host said, you've been traveling with these two creatures now for several years. Yep, about five years. And he said, uh, have they gotten to know you? Does he show you any affection? And he said, well, he ain't bit me yet. <laughs> <laughs> so then we go on the show. Now, this mm-hmm. is the same day. I'm saying that their equivalent of Elvis Presley had died. Yeah. And they said, we would like to have a moment of silence for our departed uh, showbiz Ken. And they had a moment of silence. And they said, and now here's the Kingston Trio to sing, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley. Poor boy, you're bound to die. Oh, <laughs> and the act died. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> well, talking about that song, I know you have a million songs you love, but if, if there was only one that you could pick from to do, what, what would it be? Is, is there one? I'm, I... You know, that's a question that uh, we've been asked frequently. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite song out mm-hmm. of all? Because the Kingston Trio had about a 400 song recorded history. And with my uh, new group, the Folk Legacy Trio, we've recorded already maybe 30 songs. Yeah. And we've only been around for uh, two and a half years. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess the flippant answer is my favorite song is the one I'm singing now. Okay. But one of the songs that comes to my mind is a song written by Noel Stuckey. He's Paul of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Oh, okay. Uh, Noel Paul Stuckey is his entire name. And I heard this song that he wrote uh, specifically for a show that I was a co-creator of um, at a theater down in L.A. area. And I said, I'm going to record that with my new group. It's called Standing on the Shoulders. And it really spoke about what it is that Rick and Cherry and I do with the Folk Legacy Trio. Uh, we've embraced all the music of the great folk era. And keeping that in mind, we are standing on the shoulders of the folk greats that went before us. The Kingston Trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary, yeah. Tom Paxton, Judy Collins, Bob Dylan, uh, Joan mm-hmm, Baez, yeah. just on and on and on. And so we recorded uh, Noel's song, Standing on the Shoulders. And the title comes from what Sir Isaac Newton was asked about, uh, Master, how did you come up with all these great theories? And he said, I'm merely standing on the shoulders of the giants who came before me. Mm. So we recorded the song and put it on a CD. And I went to the database where you go to pay your licensing fee in order to uh, pay the proper amount of money to the writers of the songs and the publishing companies. Standing on the shoulders wasn't there. So I called up Noel and I said, uh, have you put standing on the shoulders into the agency yet? He said, no, no. So I was going to see him in concert about uh, two or three weeks later. And uh, I took him a check and I gave it to him for the licensing fee. And he said, what's that for? And I said, you need to pay attention to business and get that into the Harry Fox agency right now. <laughs> that, was, that, that's, that, that was great of you to uh, pay him for... Uh royalties or for whatever. Well, you have to do the right thing in yeah. this business. You know, musicians are, well, especially now during uh, the era of COVID, uh, we don't have any work. You know, my group, the Folk Legacy Trio, has lost 34 concerts since March the 1st. Mm. And I just got news as we came on the set today mm. that our first concert will be, may I mention it? Sure, please do. It is going to be at Dixie State College in St. George, Utah on October the 28th. Okay, so that's a one date we can't get you here, okay. <laughs> but that'll be our first concert after all this time uh, apart from COVID. That's I right. haven't even seen my two partners, uh, Rick and Jerry, really? since March the 1st. Yeah. Well, Rick lives in San Francisco, California. Jerry's in Palm Springs. Yeah, I know. Now, I know one of you guys writes, or all of you write, um, is that correct? You write some uh, some of your own stuff? Yeah, especially Rick. Rick okay. is the most uh, proliferate uh, mm-hmm. writer of all of us. I used to write primarily when I was in uh, Nashville in the early 70s. Mm-hmm. I went there to be the next big star. 
And I got there on a bus that had about a thousand guys on it who were going to be the next, next big, big star. star. <laughs> okay. So then what'd you do? Well, I was very fortunate uh, to have signed on with a theme park there called Opryland. Oh, I've heard of it. Yeah, it's no longer in existence, but it was a music-based theme park. Mm -hmm. And I was part of what they call, believe it or not, the folk show. And because I was um, a, a part of Opryland, mm -hmm. I had access to the backstage area of the Grand Ole Opry House. They had just moved from the Ryman Auditorium out to their new facility, new in 1973. And I went backstage and introduced myself to everybody because mm -hmm. I wanted to be the next big star. Sure. And I ended up uh, being a studio musician. I got to play with all of the old cadre there as a backup musician. People like Roy Acuff, Loretta Lynn, and Johnny Cash, and Ernest Tubb. And it was just a wonderful mm -hmm. training ground. Yeah. And the thing that I learned more than anything else was you have to be good in order to, to play. You have to know all of the, the hot licks. You have to know music. I learned what not to play and when not to play. Okay. Roy Acuff would turn around and he'd say, don't play there. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. What do you play? What, tell, tell everyone the instruments you play. Well, I'm a banjo and a guitar player. And I say I'm a banjo player proudly because there aren't that many of us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and so we have to kind of stick together. Yeah. So um, it's it's one of those things that once it gets into your soul, it doesn't leave. I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. What's and you played again like all over the world? But what's the largest crowd you've played to? I'd say probably a little over twenty five thousand, oh, and that was in nice. Kansas City. It was obviously outdoors. Okay. It was not in a. We never did the uh, stadium seating or the you know the big, uh, like the um, um, new Oakland Raiders stadium. Not mm. Oakland Raiders. That's the Las Vegas Raiders. Las Vegas. That's right. Yeah. I know. It's hard to give up old habits, isn't it? Yes. I know. So we never played large places like that, but um, twenty five thousand plus outdoors in uh, the summertime in Kansas mm -hmm. City. Quite a thrill. Yeah. What about the uh, smallest crowd you played to? Oh, when I first started with the Kingston Trio mm -hmm. in 1976, everybody knew the name Kingston Trio, but it, it, folk music had sort of gone on the wane. And we had to rebuild the name and rebuild the fact that we were out there performing and get people to come and listen mm -hmm. to the Kingston Trio once again. Mm -hmm. Because by 1976, we're talking about, you know, the, the Beatles had come and the, and the Beach Boys and all the great rock and roll music that was out there. Right. It was just, music was proliferating at an uncanny, at a logarithmic rate mm -hmm. at that point. Right. So we would play any place that we could get a job. And I think we played for about 10 people in a pool hall in uh, Sausalito, California. Ah, I think I was there, I, but uh, yeah. no. But um, it, that, you know, the career you've had has been amazing and everything you've done and you've seen. You're, you're now coming back with the uh, Folk Legacy Trio doing similar stuff from back in the 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s. How, are you, how is the audience responding to, to that type of music? Pretty incredibly. Because the people that will come and see the Folk Legacy Trio were fans of the Kingston Trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary. You know, mm -hmm. that, all of that music that uh, was so popular from the late 50s, the early 60s, through about the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily our demographic. And we, th there are so many of us baby boomers around yeah. that uh, we're not at a loss yeah. for work. I know. I love, I love hearing you guys uh, perform and sing. Um, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. And uh, we'll be playing some of your music so uh, people will be able to hear what you've been doing and what the Folk Legacy Trio does. But with that, I want to thank you, George, for being my guest. We'll try to get you back on in the near future. But right now, this is Evan Davis, Vegas Voice Celebrity Corner, saying see you next week. <laughs>